Well, good morning. Happy Father's Day to all the men who are here. Thank you for being here, all right? Whether you're single, married, uh, a father or not, all of you had a father. So, happy Father's Day to you. We're glad that you're here. I need four volunteers. Do I have four ladies? Four ladies that would volunteer to pass out books. All right, uh, two, two. All right, come on up. Three, up four right here. All right, I got four. All right, perfect, perfect. Oh, who's, okay. Um, maybe I better take one, one guy. Or are you just going to take handfuls of books? All right, there you go. Can you handle that one? All right, all right, all right, all right. Just pass one out. Every man in the building gets a gift today, all right? Um, I, it, it, in the last service, uh, when they passed out, one guy popped off and said, Is it cigars? <laughs> I, 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 I understand some of us would have been happier that I did receive one today, all right? I got a Father's Day gift from a member of the church today. And um, just so you know, on the back, right here on its label, it says, my father, number five. Aww. All right, so that's pretty cool, huh? I just might have to have that this afternoon. All right. Anyway, welcome to New Hope Church. Good to have you with us today, and uh, it's a joy. You know, you guys might be shocking me today. Uh, we, had a, we had an overflow crowd in the 8 o'clock service, Okay. I expected this one to be down, and it's just a tad, all right, because I've often said Mother's Day is in the top three attended Sundays of the year, and Father's Day is in the bottom three attended Sundays of the year, but you guys just may, you may surprise me, all right? It's looking good today. Um, thank you for coming to the New Hope Cooling Station. Uh, you can stay till, till noon, all right, if you'd like, you know, hang out for two services, use our air conditioning, uh, just know you're paying for it, all right, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but take advantage of it, thank you so very much. Uh, if you are a guest today, it's your first time at New Hope, we are honored to have you here, and uh, we would love to know that you were here. There are some communication cards in the pew in front of you. Uh, I hope you would take one, fill it out, drop it in the offering bag. We promise we're not going to beat on your door. We're not going to pester you on the phone, but through the mail, send you information we hope will answer a lot of questions you might have about New Hope uh, Community Church. Let me, uh, let me highlight a few announcements and then some prayer requests that are not on your bulletin and we'll get engaged in our worship. Uh, sign up sheets that are coming around, these are not new. There are two things that uh, we still need some help on. Uh, world changers. Um, World Changers is a group of high school kids from all over the United States, and they're going to be uh, in communities all across the United States, and they're here for a good purpose. They are to, here to help and to care for people who possibly cannot help and care for themselves. And so they do projects inside the home, outside the home. Uh, it is an act of love. It is an act of caring. It is an act of giving. And so what wonderful lessons for uh, high school students to be learning. And so uh, we've been doing this uh, with them for about 20 years. And so if um, you can help out with some food preparation, we serve them lunch for four days, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And so all we have left our two main dishes, all right, on Thursday. Uh, excuse me, let me say that again. One main dish and one fruit, all right, enough to take care of 15. And so that's coming around. I think everything else has been taken care of. So we're going to start that going around. And then also on the same sheet, we have Vacation Bible School. These are the few supplies that we have left that we need to take care of. This year, we are uh, offering Vacation Bible School free, all right? Uh, to our regular church family, you can afford to, uh, to make a donation. That is terrific. Uh, but our board said, we don't want any child not to come because their parents think they couldn't afford it. And so if you can donate, great. If you can't, that's okay. Uh, we're happy to have as many kids as we can put in the place. All right? And that starts a week from tomorrow. Um, the bathrooms will be ready for you next Sunday. All right? So if you are here today and you're a guest, you don't realize where our bathrooms are under construction. We have restrooms right across the pavilion here and also in our children's center and in the office. Just ask an usher on the way out if you don't know where they are and they will direct you. So those should be finished by next Sunday. Uh, what's going to begin to take place this week in here is uh, the carpet is ripped off the stage. 
They are going to extend the stage to the wall on both sides, gives us a little bit of extra space. Um, then it will be decorated for Vacation Bible School, which just happens to be a warehouse <laughs> theme. So it's going to look like a warehouse up there. It's going to be a wood cement floor. And uh, the week then after VBS, when you come back, it should have a very different look up here. Uh, it's going to be a wood floor on the stage, all right? Uh, very similar to what you have in the foyer. And uh, then after that, there's going to be some work done behind where the cross is on that back wall. So uh, that, that will then wrap up the remodel work we had for, uh, for the sanctuary. So uh, it might be a little messy on the stage for the next couple of Sundays, okay? But after that, we should be back to uh, pretty much normal. All right, uh, let's see here. Your baby bottles were due back today. I know people were bringing them up. All right, you can give them to the ushers. They'll take them over to the office. Change for babies that we started on Mother's Day and you return on Father's Day to help Pregnancy Care Center. Thank you so much for doing that. Uh, the Garden of Innocence uh, is going to be a week from this coming Saturday or two weeks from yesterday out at Mountain View Cemetery. And uh, if you would like to come and be a part of that, or is that this coming Saturday? What's today today? 18th. Yeah, that's this Saturday. Okay, good thing I just remembered that. Uh, I have plans Saturday morning, babe. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, so anyway, that's this Saturday morning, and it's going to be bright and early because it's going to be a hot day, and uh, it'll be about a 45-minute to an hour ceremony there. Uh, you need more information about it, please read it in the bulletin. Uh, they still need a few more volunteers for Vacation Bible School, and so see either Mark or Jennifer at us today. Uh, or pull a card out of the pew and say VBS volunteer and they will follow up with you and all the volunteers please notice next Sunday at 1215 there will be a volunteer meeting so you get your directions and marching orders for the week all right uh, please notice a couple of needs for prison fellowship that are also listed in the bulletin speaking of prison fellowship may I direct your attention to the insert in the bulletin all right uh, this is a short notice, but I think it's going to be a whole lot of fun and enjoyable event. Um, how many of you have ever heard of Sherman Williams? Okay, I don't mean Sherwin Williams. That's the painter. This is one letter makes a difference, all right? This is Sherman Williams. Sherman Williams was the backup running back behind Emmett Smith for the Dallas Cowboys. All right, so he didn't get to start much, but he did get to play pretty regularly. He was very good. He played college ball at Alabama and uh, was an All-American there. He has a new book out called uh, Crimson Cowboy, combining his Alabama days and his Dallas Cowboy days. Um, Sherman made some very poor decisions in his life, and he ended up in prison for 15 years. And during that time, he discovered Jesus Christ. And his life has not been the same. And since he has been released from prison, he's been very active with PF. Sherman Williams is going to be in Fresno uh, the week of VBS. And uh, since he's closely connected to Joe Avila, Joe said, hey, do you want to speak at, 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 at the church where I attend? And he said, I'd be happy to. So we realized the stage is going to be torn apart and it's going to look like a, a warehouse, all right, for VBS. But on Wednesday night, VBS is in the morning this year, so on Wednesday night here in the sanctuary, we're going to hear Sherman Williams speak. He's bringing his daughter to Fresno State. She is an athlete, and she's checking out Fresno State as one of the possible schools that she might be attending. And uh, Joe Avila and a group of guys are going to be barbecuing hot dogs at 6 o'clock, so if you want to come... Uh, we'll have the fans on out there, all right? Uh, we might even try to have a room because VBS is going on. We'll see what room's available if you need to get inside to eat your hot dog. And then you'll come on into the sanctuary at 7 o'clock, and it'll be a one-hour one hour time with Sherman Williams, and he'll have books here as well as share his life story. So uh, invite somebody to come with you. It'll be an easy, casual night, and I think it'll be very, very inspiring. Well, I'm talking about books. May I draw your attention to the books that are over here at the front table? Uh, these are the books, Enemies of the Heart, the series that we've been doing. And so um, you can come over here. It's the honor system. It is 15, 10, or free. Okay? So that's the way we're pricing the books. They cost us 15, but they're 15, 10, or free. We don't want you to not take one if you can't afford one. Uh, we want you to have this information readily available for you. We spent four months preaching about the contents uh, 
uh, out of the scripture that were uh, put together and organized in the way that Andy did as we've looked at the enemies of our heart. We're going to wrap that sermon up today and we wanted to make the book available for you. So uh, just go by, pick one up and leave your contribution there in the bowl if you would like. All right. Um, I think that takes care of all of the announcements I was supposed to make. Mayo Contetto is uh, one of our regular members here at New Hope. She's been coming, oh, 20 years. She uh, is part of our 8 o'clock crowd. And uh, as I walked by her table greeting folks today, she said, Pastor Tim, can you got a minute? And I said, sure. She said, I got to tell you, your sermon last week has caused me to do something I have never done in my life. And I said, what's that, Mio? She says, I memorized four verses of Scripture this week. I don't know if you remember me last week, I sort of launched a little bit on the importance and the value of Scripture memory work, and both from our Sunday school all the way up through adulthood, Mayo is old enough to be retired. I'm not saying that's old. I'm just saying she is retired. You cannot use, I don't think she's my perfect example, you cannot use your age as an excuse not to memorize, all right? And she is walking proof of that today. She said, I learned four. She said, here's what prompted me to do it. I was reminded I might not always have my eyesight. As my eyes get weaker, I may not always be able to read the scripture, so I need the word of my heart so I can recall the scripture as I continue to get older. That was good, good advice. Um, a few prayer requests. Lenny Bendowski has got some health issues. He's had a variety of tests. We hope that they get some good information from those tests. Be, please be praying for Lenny. Uh, Chris Bishop's dad on Thursday had a double bypass and valve replacement surgery in Southern California. And uh, this is a surgery he's been needing and wanting for over a year, but his heart would not allow that. It's finally gotten to a point. The doctor said, we believe we can do that. They were able to get it done. He is out of ICU and in his own room now. So things are going very well. We're grateful for that. Chris had a very, very busy week this week. He was at uh, junior high camp for three days. And the good news there is, as his father got a valve replacement in his heart, two of his junior high kids got a full heart replacement. They invited Jesus Christ in their life during uh, Hume Lake Camp this year. So very, very exciting. And uh, then he came down on Wednesday so that he could be at the hospital in Southern California with his mom and his dad for that surgery, and uh, back here with us leading worship and leading the high school group today. So continue to pray for Chris's dad. A good friend of mine, a few of you uh, know if you've been on the Africa trip, Dr. J. Cox, the orthopedic surgeon, uh, had emergency heart valve replacement surgery Thursday. And uh, he is also out of ICU and in his own room. And his wife, uh, last uh, text I got early this morning, said he's doing much better. So we're grateful for that. Uh, let's see, Betty Drew, who normally sits right here or here, okay? Um, she's a lady who always needs a hug from me every Sunday morning. Sits right here. She waits for it, all right? Uh, Betty's just a pistol. She's 88 years old. Uh, just full of energy in life. She was so full of energy in life when her doorbell rang that she fell on the way to answer the door, and she f broke her hip. Uh, second time. So she says, now I have two good hips, all right, because she's had them both fixed. Uh, this is not one of those situations, as we sometimes hear when older people fall, that it's the beginning of you know, this will not be true for Betty, okay? Uh, we had to quiet Betty down in her ER room. She was having a party, all right, with her neighbors that were there. And um, when I walked in, I said, Betty, are you in pain? She said, only when I move, Pastor, only when I move. Uh, so I'm laying real still. Uh, she's out. She had her surgery. The doctor said it went as perfect as it could go. Uh, she is at Sam Joaquin Gardens Rehab. All right, and she hopes to be out of there in a week, but her daughter said she's staying two weeks. And uh, so do be, do be praying for uh, Betty and her recovery there. Um, uh, not listed in the bulletin are two other families. We have services for memorial services this week, the Wells and the Burr family, B-I-R-R. -R. And then Brandy Walker, um, her grandmother and her aunt are part of our 8 o'clock service. Brandy has visited with us on several occasions. If you'll recall, about 18 months ago to two years ago, we were praying for Brandy because they found cancer in her eye, and they thought she was going to lose her eye and possibly her life. Uh, was able to get an experimental program back in Boston, and uh, the cancer went into remission, and they saved her eye. Um, so that's been good news. The, the bad news today is 
uh, the cancer is back. I don't know the extent of that yet. We'll find that out later this week, but would appreciate you remembering to pray for Brandy. Uh, I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward if they would, please, and wait on us as we have our morning tithes and offering. Would you join with me as we pray, and then our worship team will come back and lead us in our worship. Our Father in heaven, we love you. We thank you for your incredible love for us. Father, it is, um, it is quite warm outside, and yet you're not surprised by that. What most of us don't realize or we don't remember from our, uh, from our lessons in school is, is that without irrigation, this valley was a desert. And uh, it certainly is expressing the temperatures of a desert for us right now. Uh, we are grateful for the creativity of the um, mind of man to come up with an invention called air conditioning. And we are so happy to make ourselves available to the blessings of it. We say thank you for that. But Father, thank you that um, the various weathers that you give to us are important for various crops that are grown here. There are benefits to this kind of weather. Sometimes we think about just our own personal comfort, but um, Father, you have a a wisdom and a plan that often is much bigger than what we, we perceive. So we simply say thank you for what you provide for us that is so very, very important. Lord, we trust you with the needs that we've expressed here today and others that uh, are very personal to those who are present. From physical needs like, um, like two men who've had heart valves replaced to the discovery of cancer to tests that still have uncertain results. Lord, for Charlene Dooms today, uh, Bernice has been back to Stanford. Um, the good news is that Charlene has improved significantly from what her condition was the first of the week. So we just continue to lift her up to you as she recovers from her bone marrow transplant. Father, thank you for this day that uh, in our nation has been set aside to remember our dads. Uh, I'm so blessed to still have my dad with me. And one of these days, Father, um, both of my fathers will be together you and him, but you have chosen to allow me for this long to still have my dad, and I'm grateful. Father, there are a lot of folks in the room whose dads are no longer with them, but thank you for the sweet memories and the treasured moments that they can recall. And then, Father, there are occasions in which dads did not carry out their responsibilities as you designed dads to be. And so I pray that um, the things we've been learning in this sermon series of a forgiveness will come into play for them so they won't continue to be riddled with, with regrets. And so thank you that we all can have a heavenly Father who will love us and care for us and provide for us exactly what we need. And Father, on this day, may we give the appropriate honor to our dads that it's worthy of. For the privilege of giving and sharing today, we say thank you. We commit this to you in the incredible name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Good morning. I got a, a little thing to do before we jump into the sermon. Um, we've had a young couple who've been part of our church for about four years now, all right? And um, he got a big promotion. We just talked about celebration, remember, that overcomes jealousy, all right? Uh, so if somebody gets the big promotion, all right, you ought to be really excited for them and celebrate with them. I threw that message right out the window because I hate the fact that he got the promotion, all right? And the reason I hate the fact he got the promotion is because it means he had to move away. He hasn't got back in here yet, has he? He's probably, hold on, he's out here. Where's Peter? Is he coming back in? No, oh, Peter, come this way, come this way. Come this way. No, come. Yeah. yeah, no, no, no. Your wife's coming up to join you. Amanda, come on up. Come on up. Yes. Come on up. Come on up. Here's Peter. Now that you all know he's been to the restroom, uh, <laughs> I was talking about you while you were out of the room, and then I looked back and I didn't see you there. Uh, I. I I, I told him how I didn't follow my own sermon advice. I wasn't celebrating with you when you got your job promotion. Um, uh, anyway, he got his job promotion. He's with PG&E. They moved him up uh, to the edge of the Bay Area. And uh, it's a great job. It's wonderful benefits and privileges for them. 
Uh, he's getting to a place that he thought would be five or six years farther down the road very early. Um, and so, but this wonderful couple, Shelly and I had the privilege of having a small group with them and uh, got very good acquainted with them. And uh, it's been a pleasure to have them part of our church family. Um, Peter was one of those that I had already chatted with, and he was open to heading, learning more about leadership in the church, all right? I saw this as a future board member here, all right? <laughs> and um, now they've moved on us. They've already moved, all right? So I thought we were going to miss the opportunity because they, they were gone for a month on vacation, all right, uh, before we started the new job. And they've now moved up there. The furniture goes up this week, I think you told me. Mm -hmm. And uh, their house up there is an escrow. And so hopefully everything works timing-wise. But we're going to miss them. And I just want to pray over them because they've been part of our church family and they're leaving us. And uh, uh, we want them to find a church family up there that they connect with and that they grow in and that they continue to maintain this vibrant love for each other and their vibrant love for Christ. All right? And we want to see children come by here every now and then. All right? <laughs> So bring children by. So let's pray for them. All right, would you join with me? Father, um, part of the joy of being a pastor are the people that you bring into our lives, uh, the people that become part of our family and our church here. And one of the tough things about being a pastor is when those who come um, have opportunities that take them away. And uh, we both, um, we experience the pleasures of delight for them and the new opportunities and also the, the sense of, of loss. Uh, we pray for your absolute best for them. And uh, you know, we know that you have steps ordained for them to follow. And we pray that they will find a church family that ministers to them and that they can continue to show their leadership in them. We pray that um, their own personal family will be in great health. And uh, we just simply pray for your best in their lives. Thank you for the time that you gave us with them. And we look forward to our lives crossing many, many more times in the future. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you too. All right. Love you. Now they'll never come back and visit us again since I brought him in the... Okay, guys. Uh, this is a wrap-up Sunday. This is ending the uh, four-month, four-and-a-half-month series we've been in called Enemies of the Heart. That's something I've never done before. I, I took a book, actually, and used it as the foundation of a sermon uh, series, knowing that the content of that book has got its roots in the Scripture. And uh, so we're going to do a little review, and then I have, as I told you last week, a little surprise subject wrap-up, all right, uh, for you today. We'll bring this to a conclusion. But let's just, let's, let me just, I'm going to ask you to talk back to me for a while as we do one last uh, review of the material. Um, all of us have a physical heart. We know where it is, all right? It's, it's somewhere between here and here, all right? And it's an organ, and it pumps blood, and it's what gives us life. We know that there are enemies to this heart. We've just mentioned two prayer requests today, all right, for Chris's dad who had to have a heart valve replacement and double bypass. Um, Dr. J back in Ohio had to have a heart valve replacement. He had already had one and double bypass two years ago. Um, and so we know that there are things that can go wrong with his heart. Doctors tell us there are things we can do that can help the health of our physical heart. Uh, we can create some healthy habits. One of those is uh, we can probably adjust diet somewhat, all right? Uh, number two, we can have some kind of exercise routine. Most of you know, but the first time I ever experienced heart trouble, I'll remember, I think I was about eight years old. Dr. Scott was my pediatrician, and he listened to my heart and had this funny look on his face, and he said to my parents, we need to do a little test. I had a heart murmur. Okay, nothing serious, never bothered me again, never know that I had, it actually didn't bother me then, just, you got a heart murmur, and I figure as long as you got a murmur, it's still working. <laughs> and until uh, I went in for a physical two years ago, and they didn't like what they heard, and 72 hours later, I had three stents in my heart. I'd never had heart issues, and so they say, here are things that you can do, and you can lose weight, you can eat better, and you can exercise more. All right, man, for seven, eight months, I ate better, I exercised a lot, all right, and I lost weight. I did all three of those. Um, I'm 18 pounds back of the 21 pounds I lost. I hate it, okay? Um, not so much for my heart, but for the way I looked at a picture in the swimming pool yesterday at the house. Um, uh, um, but healthy habits, 
uh, and we find good excuses not to maintain healthy habits. If you recall, probably nine, ten months ago, I got up here one Sunday and said, this is the best I have felt in years. I was doing healthy habits. I've got a couple of uh, meniscus tears that need to be repaired. I'm using that as an excuse not to maintain one of those healthy habits. We find an excuse not to continue. That has implications on us physically. We need to understand the same principles that apply to our physical heart also have implications for our spiritual life. Just as there are enemies of our physical heart, there are enemies of this thing inside of us that we can't put a finger on, we can't locate it. You can't take an MRI or a CAT scan or an X-ray and find the heart that the Bible talks about. It is that part of us that I say is the convergence of our mind, emotions, and will, all right? We say our mind is in our brain, but find it for me. In that mess of, yes, And this has even more power behind it because he has 17 stents in his heart, all right? So <laughs> 17, all right, unbelievable. Uh, yes, just illustrating my point, good habits are important. And even more so because to die physically is still to live eternally. Where are you going to spend that eternity? And so spiritual habits are even of greater importance than physical habits. Because there's this part of us that's invisible. It's that convergence of mind, emotion, and will, that person that makes our essence who we are. And the Bible refers to it again and again throughout the Scripture as our heart. Book of Jeremiah, chapter 17. Some of you will remember it's the foundational Scripture for this series. The heart is what? It's deceitful. It is desperately wicked. There is no cure for it. Who can understand it? Jeremiah just laid it out there, pretty plain and simple for us. Our heart, that invisible part of us that all of us are born with, it has a tendency more towards evil than it does towards good. It has a tendency to pursue independence from God rather than dependence on God. We would rather do our own thing rather than follow the leadership of someone else. And so we have this battle within us that Paul said, the things I want to do, I don't do, and the things I don't want to do, I do do. And that's where you end up when you don't do the things that you should do. And so we got this heart condition that can be overcome by healthy habits. The good news about what Jeremiah said is in order in the scripture, the very next prophet, Ezekiel, writes for us in Ezekiel 36, 26. He says, I want to give to you a new heart. I want to take out your heart of stone. I want to give to you a heart of flesh. What does that mean? It, it means our original invisible heart is one that is stubborn against God. It's not susceptible to God's leadership. And God said... I want to remove that from you, if you'll let me. I want to replace it with a new heart that is a flesh, meaning it is open to the leadership. And it says, go read Ezekiel 26, 36, uh, 36, 26. It says, that will follow the leadership of my spirit in you. When I give to you a fleshy heart, I'll give to you my spirit so that you can follow the leadership of the spirit in your life. And once we begin that relationship with him, there are then habits that we can create that will be very healthy. Let's look at the four enemies of our heart. Let's just highlight them real quick. What was the first enemy that we looked at? Guilt. What was the second enemy that we looked at? Anger. What was the third enemy that we looked at? Greed. What was the last enemy we looked at? Jealousy. So guilt, anger, greed, jealousy. We notice that all four of these enemies of our heart create a debt-to-debtor relationship. 
And anytime there's a debt that is owed, no matter which way it goes, there's always a sense of conflict that gets created when we have this sense of debt. So with, with guilt, the enemy of the heart called guilt, what is the debt? I owe you. In other words, I've done something against you that I feel sorry for. I'm guilty. I've treated you badly. And you know what the, the interesting thing about this is? Sometimes you don't even know I treated you badly because I did it with a smile on my face. Sometimes I treated you badly and you don't know it because I did it behind your back. But I have a sense of guilt. I owe you. The second thing is anger. What's the debt relationship with this enemy called anger? You owe me. You've done something that I didn't like. You've done something that I don't appreciate. So you owe me a debt. And guess what? Sometimes you don't even know that. Because what you did, you did it out of kindness. You did it out of generosity. But I took it very differently. And so I have this, this, this sense that you owe me. I'm mad at you. And when you boil anger down in this debt that you owe me something, what are we really saying about you and me? You didn't give me what I want. In this relationship that exists between you and me, I didn't get from you what I want. And so I'm mad at you. The third word was greed. What's the debt to debtor relationship here? I owe me. In other words, I want that stuff. I deserve that. I've worked hard. I've suffered a long time. So I owe this to me. And jealousy, what's that debt to debtor relationship there? God owes me. It's not that I want to take from you what God's given to you. I just want God to give to me the same thing or better than what he's given to you. I mean, why did you get that and I didn't get it? So God, you owe me. And so those are the four enemies. What are the four healthy habits to overcome those four enemies of our heart? Guilt says, you owe me. How do I overcome that enemy in my heart? What was that? Confession. That's right. I need to confess. You ticked me off. I'm mad at you. Okay? All right? God! I'm sorry for what I've done. I, uh, it just dawned on me, 8 o'clock service this morning. Uh, this Thursday evening... I will celebrate um, my 57th birthday. Yeah, this Thursday evening. I'll, I'll, I'll share my 57th birthday. Some of you are looking at me funny and saying, Tim, I know you're 62. <laughs> but this Thursday is the anniversary date or the birthday date of when I gave my life to Jesus Christ. It was at Hume Lake Christian Camp, third Thursday of June. I was five years old. And some of you are saying, Tim, how could you be old enough to invite Jesus Christ in your life? Here's, here's what I knew. See, I, I was blessed to have godly parents and godly grandparents. So I saw from the time I was an infant all the way to the whopping age of five, I was able to see, witness, and experience unconditional love from my mom, from my dad, from my grandfathers, from my grandmothers, most of my aunts and uncles. I experienced unconditional love. I was able to witness what loving relationships look like. And even at the age of five, I was able to witness the pain that I could bring to my parents when I was disobedient or sneaky or rebellious. I saw the pain that it brought. And so on that third Thursday at Hume, in the month of June, and I heard John Wood preach a sermon from John 3.16, for God so loved, pardon me? Yeah, Linwood, not John. Thank you, Pops. <laughs> he may be 91, but he still has his memory. You on the <laughs> John Wood was his father, all right? Um, as Linwood preached, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him would not perish, but have everlasting. When, 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 when Lynn expressed the incredible love of God for us, in a childish way, I connected that with my own earthly father's love for me. 
And when I understood that what my rebellion as a small child would do to my parents, how much more would my rebellion against God hurt him? And when Lynn gave the invitation at the end of that service, I remember getting up off that wooden bench and walking down and coming to another wooden bench up front called an altar, and I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Confession. Confession took care of the guilt that I had. Anger, what's the, uh, what's the good habit we need to develop to overcome anger? Forgiveness. We need to forgive others. In the same, remember, in the same way as God in Christ forgave us, we need to forgive each other. Let me ask you a question. As Jesus was walking up the road to the top of Golgotha's hill where he would be crucified, was there a crowd of people already assembled up there on top of that mountain on their knees asking God to forgive them? Nobody was there asking for a thing. And yet Jesus carried his cross, was nailed to it, and hung there. No one but a disciple or two and his mama. And what did Jesus say? Father, forgive them, for they do not know or understand what it is that they are doing to me today. Had anybody asked for his forgiveness yet? No, but he gave it. Do you understand that the sins of a five-year-old boy 57 years ago were already forgiven 2,000 years ago? I just hadn't appropriated his forgiveness 2,000 years ago for my life until the third Thursday of June in 1960. And whatever the day was, the moment that you invited Jesus Christ into your life, God has already offered you his forgiveness. You just did not become the recipient of a guilt-free life until you received his forgiveness. Charles Manson, who serves life in prison, in Corcoran prison, do you understand his sins were forgiven 2,000 years ago? I occasionally talk to believe. Now, to my knowledge... And we have Joe and many of the team from Prison Fellowship have been in and out of Corcoran many, many times. To my knowledge, Charles Manson has never invited Jesus Christ into his life. He's never appropriated that forgiveness that was paid for 2,000 years ago into his life. I have talked to believers who said, I don't believe that God has already forgiven Charles Manson. And they're saying, I don't believe in the all-sufficiency of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ for the sins of the world. Unfortunately, I've even heard some Christians say, I hope Charles Manson never finds Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. Isn't that sad? I mean, he's getting his just desserts. I'm glad he's incarcerated. I'm glad he's in prison. I would hope that the consequences of an earthly situation would lead him to a discovery about an eternal situation because he's going to go from a, a, a temporary incarceration to a permanent incarceration in a place called hell. And do any of us want that for anybody? I would like to think not. I've heard people say, Tim... I hate the idea that God sends somebody to hell. God doesn't send anybody to hell. We are all on the road to hell, and God has provided us a way off of that path by forgiving us 2,000 years ago of our sin. We simply need to appropriate that for our own life. God, I realize what I've done. Now that he wants us to do that for others, once we have received his forgiveness for ourselves, we are then to extend it to others. And that certainly goes a long ways to overcoming our anger issues. As Christ forgave us, so we forgive others. Then greed, what is the, I spent a little longer on that, I'm stepping on something my pen um, what's the healthy habit for greed generous giving instead of generous wanting let's overcome it with generous giving the fourth one jealousy what's the cure for jealousy celebration celebration instead of being jealous over what somebody has let's celebrate with them instead of being jealous over promotion somebody got then and causing them to move away from us let's celebrate with them all right 
Let's rejoice with them. Somebody gets a, a new car and it's something bigger than a Fiat. Let's not be angry over the fact that they got something bigger than a Fiat. All right? That you can't be farther than what your extension cord will take you. All right? Let's celebrate. <laughs> Let's celebrate with them. Hey? I had to go across town the other day and I called John because he's halfway in between. I said, John, don't leave your office just in case I don't have enough juice to get home. All right? You can give me a ride. Um, all right, we're going to get to the message today, and I, I think I can do this in 20 minutes, all right? Here we go. Uh, some of you in here will remember, some of you grew up in Southern Baptist churches, some of you grew up in Nazarene churches, some of you grew up in some Assembly of God churches, that was your background. So when I say hellfire and damnation, you understand what I'm talking about? When preachers used to preach that way, all right, um, they, they used to get very loud, much louder than I, I even get, and it used to sound like they were shouting. Quite frankly, it often sounded like they were angry, okay? Um, and often they were. They were angry at sin. They were angry at Satan. But it sounded like they were kind of ticked off at us. Um, but but um, often the louder a preacher got, the more amens he got. And so that's kind of what encouraged them to get louder was because they got amens more. And if you get more amens, your job secure as a preacher. Um, <laughs> so let me, let me tell this story with that context in mind. And it'll make sense to some of you. There were two elderly, excited Southern women were sitting together in the front row of their church listening to a very fiery, excitable preacher. When this preacher condemned the sin of stealing, these two ladies cried out at their top of the lungs, Amen, preacher, preach it on! When the preacher condemned the sin of lying, they jumped to their feet and they screamed, Right on, brother, tell it like it is, amen! When he talked about lust, they got so excited and told him, get after it, preacher, get after it. And then the preacher condemned the sin of gossip, and those two ladies got very quiet. <laughs> One of them turned to the other and said, he quit preaching, now he's meddling. And <laughs> so, all that to say this, I'm not going to meddle today. I'm not going to preach against gossip. I am going to talk about lust. You see, no discussion of the heart would fully be complete without addressing the subject of lust a little bit. I imagine that a large percentage of men would be very happy to double their quotient of guilt, anger, greed, or jealousy if it meant they could be free of lust that often runs rampant in our hearts. Some of you are saying, Tim, you mean women don't lust? I'm sure you do. I'm sure you do. But I certainly hear a whole lot more of it as a problem with men than I do with women. So ladies, I'm going to let you take your own application. Plus, it's Father's Day. I should pick on the guys for a little bit. Uh, if it were possible to arrange a four-for-one trade... There's a lot of men who would make that trade in a heartbeat. And there's probably a lot of wives who would be happy to broker that deal for their husbands. You see, at first glance, it may seem that lust is often to blame for at least three of the four heart disorders that we've already talked about. Sexual sin leads to guilt, for example. I've talked with dozens of people over the years whose secrets stem from illicit sexual encounters that both were invited and uninvited Sexual sin almost always leads to anger in somebody. If your spouse has been unfaithful, you no doubt remember the rage that you felt when you first discovered the betrayal. Lust can certainly fuel jealousy, but there's another correlation between lust and the arch enemies of guilt, anger, greed, and jealousy. There is a subtle difference. First of all, lust is different from these four in one very important way. This is going to shock many of you. God created lust. He even declared it good. And some of you are saying, Pastor, I've never seen that verse before. Well, it's not a verse. It's a story. And it's implied. When God created Adam and Eve, God created the concept of one flesh. Every indication is that Adam strongly desired Eve, and Eve reciprocated. But with sex came lust. This was a package deal. So, so lust can be a good thing. If it weren't for lust, none of you probably would be sitting here today. 
I got to be honest. I lust after Shelly. It's the only example I got to give here today, babe. All right. And she doesn't even have to be in the room. You see, if it weren't for lust, healthy marriages would not end up alive and well. This is lust that is focused. Whereas guilt, greed, and jealousy are all signs of trouble, but not so with lust. Lust can work for us rather than against us. Let me see if I can compare this with a couple of other things, maybe make some sense. Um, is hunger, are any of you hungry right now? few heads nodding. If you say, if you go much longer, I'll really be hungry, Tim. Um, <laughs> some of you are hungry right now. Is, is hunger a problem? Is hunger a sin? Is gluttony? It's taking something farther than it was intended. Um, uh, do you ever appreciate a, 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 a pretty dress or a pair of boots that somebody's wearing? When does appreciation and admiration become envy? There is a point that will. So something healthy becomes unhealthy. So, so before sin, before sin entered the world, there was lust between Adam and Eve. As far as I can tell, greed, anger, guilt, and jealousy didn't show up until the fall of mankind. All four were part of the story of the fall, and when sin entered the world, everything was corrupted, including lust. The other thing that's different about lust is that it is an appetite it's not going to go away. No matter how spiritual or committed we are, lust isn't a problem we solve. It's an appetite that must be managed. This need for a life under control is essential with the subject of lust. It must be focused, not eliminated. We can deal with our anger and guilt once and for all. That's what confession and forgiveness are all about, by accepting, believing, appropriating the truth of God, but not lust. It's here for the duration. It's here for a long time anyway. Based on conversations with hundreds of individuals whose misplaced lust has gotten them into trouble, here's a conclusion. We do have a renowned counselor in our service today, so you can correct me if any of this is misguided afterwards, George. Lust is rarely ever the root problem. When lust becomes problematic, it's almost always a manifestation or one or more of the other heart problems we've discussed. Clean out the anger, clean out the guilt, clean out the greed and the jealousy, and lust will become much more manageable. Deal with the big four and our ability to exercise a controlled life in the arena of our sexuality increases dramatically. Replace our heart of stone that wants to do its own thing with a heart of flesh under the influence of the Spirit of God within our own life, and life becomes much more manageable. Stanley's observation in his book is, anger and guilt in particular fuel sexual sin he said, most men I've talked to who had a serious pornography addiction also had unresolved issues with their father. That's shrink talk for he's mad at his dad. As you might imagine, these men saw no correlation between their unresolved anger and their uncontrollable lust. But there is one. You see, pornography offers a substitute for intimacy. And what every man needs from his dad is intimacy. You've heard me say it before, and if you're here very long, you'll hear me say it again and again. I was so blessed. I did not have a perfect dad, but I had a dad who never was ashamed or embarrassed or hesitant to say, son, I love you. I remember when dad gave me the sex talk. <laughs> I remember him saying, son, I want to talk about this because I love you. And I got to tell you, I've appreciated the sex talk more as a grown man than I ever did at 14, 13 when we had it. But then I thought, oh, God, what did he do that for? <laughs> Every woman I've talked to or heard about who has been sexually promiscuous had secrets and hurts that often dated back to their childhood. Move past the issues normally associated with lust and you're going to find a disease-damaged heart a heart lined with anger or guilt and even jealousy. Are, are, are there exceptions? I, I, I'm sure there must be. Just I don't hear about them very often. 
Show me a man or a woman who's battling lust on a larger than normal scale, and more than likely, we will discover someone whose heart has been thoroughly invaded by one of the big four enemies. Simply put, guilt, anger, greed, and jealousy weaken our resolve against sexual temptation. In Paul's letter to the Christians at the church of Ephesus, we get a glimpse into why this is the case when Paul writes these words, In your anger, do not what? Sin. Do not let the sun go down while you were still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. I discovered this week in preparing for today, I have been too narrow on my application of that verse. Do not let anger prompt you to sin. I've often interpreted, talked about it by this. Hey, don't let your anger cause you to say mean things. Don't let your anger to cause you to do mean things. Don't let your anger become violent. I think that's far too narrow. Do not let your anger push you towards an unfocused lust. Do not let your anger prompt you to go out and spend money you don't have. Did you ever do that? Satisfy your anger, just go spend. Don't let your anger prompt you to go do things that you shouldn't do because anger gives the devil a foothold in our lives. Unresolved anger serves as an avenue through which Satan has access to any part of our soul. And he's smart enough to know that nothing wreaks havoc on the human life like sexual sin. Nothing destroys an individual's capacity for intimacy like sexual impurity. So Satan leverages our anger for his own ends, and in the end, we pay dearly. Think about some of your own experience. Isn't it true that when you're angry, you're more vulnerable to temptations, including sexual temptations, than normal? Anger distorts our thinking, thrusts our decision-making ability. Remember, when we're angry, it's because we're convinced that somebody owes me something. Anger desensitizes us to the harm we're inflicting on others or ourselves at a time when we feel we owe it to ourselves to do whatever we want. Andy recalls a time when he was a youth pastor. He said, years ago while working with high school students, I overheard a conversation I'll never forget. I was driving a church van to camp. Two 10th grade girls, sophomores, were seated directly behind me, whispering but not quiet enough where I could not hear them. At some point in the conversation, one of the girls asked her friend, would you ever let John, you know... From there, she described in teen speech an activity considered by most as inappropriate for unmarried people to be engaged in. But that wasn't the shocker. It was her friend's response that blew Andy away. She said, if I'd just had a fight with my mom, I might let him. A fight with her mom? What, what does that have to do with anything in that conversation? At 15 years old, she was already experiencing a relationship between her anger and her vulnerability sexually. Anger in one relationship made her vulnerable in another. What's true of anger is also true of guilt and greed and jealousy. All four reduce our resolve against these kinds of temptation. They tilt us off balance emotionally, leaving us vulnerable. They're like an out-of-control virus weakening our spiritual immune system. You see, if a person is filled with anger, what controls their lives? That's not a trick question. Anger, yeah. If a, if a person is filled with greed, what dominates their life? Greed, yeah. If a person is filled with lust, what motivates their decisions? Lust, yeah. If a person is filled with love, what influences what they do? Love. And if a person is filled with the Holy Spirit... He can be controlled by the Spirit. If you will, this is control by consent. So what do we do about lust? Do we ignore it? Do we chalk it up as a symptom that can't be helped? <laughs> I certainly hope not. It must be contained, properly focused. We always have a need for self-control regardless of how healthy or unhealthy our hearts become. My point simply is this. Our battle for sexual purity must be waged on several fronts. 
A healthy heart puts in stronger position to ward off temptation. Confessing, forgiving, celebrating. These are habits that strengthen our resolve and move, remove the enemy's base of operation in our life. The healthier our hearts, the easier it will be for us to keep this God-given appetite properly focused and under control. Do you guys, uh, what was that... Um, what was that exercise guy's name? Uh, wore the uh, spaghetti strap T-shirts and the big baggy pants and the Afro hair. <laughs> Richard Simmons, yeah. Um, I, I want to act like him for just a few minutes. I, I, I don't want to look like him, okay? But I want to act like him for just a moment. You, you see, I think there's a rhythm to life I'd like us to get into. So uh, I'm, I'm going to give you these four words, and then I'm going to ask you to repeat them with me. And we're going to try to get into a little rhythm here, all right? Confess, forgive, give. Celebrate, confess, forgive, give, celebrate. You guys with me? All right, here, now I want you to join me. Now let's start off. Confess, forgive, give, celebrate. Come on, stand with me for a moment now. Come on, stand with me. I want you to get, I want you to get in this, all right? I want you to get in with me. Come on, stand up. Here we go. We're going to do it again. We're going to start over here with confess this time, all right? Confess, forgive, give, celebrate, confess, forgive. Come on, guys, get with me. Celebrate, confess, forgive. Give, celebrate. You may sit down now, all right? Here's the deal. We need to get into a rhythm of thinking that way every single morning. Every single morning. Start our day off with confess, forgive, give, celebrate. That's what God wants from us, to put this in perspective. Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient and kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it doesn't delight in evil, it protects, trusts, hopes, perseveres. How often? Always. Angry people are not patient people, and guilty people are not kind, and jealous people are filled with envy, and greedy people cannot help but boast, and anger makes us rude, and greed tempts us to be self-seeking, and jealousy thrives on scorekeeping, and greedy people are self-protecting, and guilt keeps us from trusting. Do you get the point? We're commanded to love one another. A new command, Jesus said, I give unto you, John 13, 34, love one another. How? As I have loved you, you must love one another. This is not one of his options for us. So let me wrap this up. Where do we go from here? If you're not sure where to start in developing a healthy heart, if you're not sure what your, what your greatest struggles are, is it guilt? Is it anger? Is it greed? Is it jealousy? If you're unsure where to start, can I point you in the direction of the people who know you best? The people that you do life with? Your spouse? Your kids? Your parents? Co-workers? You see, they catch the overflow of what's going on in our heart on a daily basis. They know exactly where we should start. Ask around. Some of you are like, Tim, what in the world do I ask? Glad you ask. <laughs> Here's a few suggestions. Do you think I struggle with being completely open about things? Do you feel like I have walls? Do you ever feel like you're competing with my stuff? Do you feel like I compare you to other men, women, children? Are you ever afraid to talk to me. Do you ever wonder which one of me you're coming home to? Chances are you already know how the people closest to you might answer some of these questions. I hope you decide to ask anyway. And if you do, please decide ahead of time you're not going to defend yourself. Because if you do, you're not going to learn a thing. If you're not inclined to discuss this with your family and friends, then I recommend go buy the book today and go read the section that during the sermon series made you the most uncomfortable. That's probably where the roots of the problem start with you. Somewhere in the sermon series, in the pages of that book, you winced and squirmed. That's God the Father saying, I want to work in this area of your life. Like the doctor who probes and prods until he finds the area, God's truth has a way of finding its mark, but none of that can happen until you give God access to the sensitive and sometimes off-limit areas of your life. If you do, 
what may begin as a very threatening and uncomfortable revelation may result in a freedom that you never knew existed before. Guys, we don't have to live our lives under the influence of guilt and anger and greed and jealousy and lust. We can live in the freedom of God's love. Let's pray. Father, thank you for, first and foremost, your scripture. Thank you for what it teaches to us about ourselves and about this life and about you. Father, thank you for moving in Andy's mind several years ago as he organized these thoughts in a pattern that makes it easy for us to get a hold of. And Father, thank you for your activity in our services over the weeks as from Sunday to Sunday, men, women, some young adults have said, Tim, whew, that really hit me and I'm, I'm learning to deal with some things I couldn't deal with before. Father, I pray for your ongoing work in all of our lives. May we give you the freedom and may we have honest hearts open enough to listen to your voice, whether it's from your scripture, from our spouse, from our best friend. May we listen to the voice that says, confess, forgive, give, celebrate. May that become a rhythm for our life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. One last time, what's the rhythm? Confess, forgive, give. Celebrate. Go have a great day.